welcome to this month's Denise Amberley Foundation Wednesday webinar. Uh, we're so excited to have Sergeant Jesse Carr here for their presentation on improving communication among conflict. <coughs> uh, following the webinar, we're going to send out the certificate and the link for the replay. Um, and we'll also be uploading the webinar to YouTube uh, for easy access. Um, for those of us that, for those of you that are joining us, um, thank you so much for being here today. And thank you so much for those of you that registered for last week. Um, I know we had to push it forward another week. So thank you guys for your flexibility and for joining us today. Um, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, the Denise Amber Lee Foundation was founded by Denise's husband, Nathan Lee, in June of 2008, six months after her tragic death. Um, the foundation's mission is to help 911 centers across the country to avoid any similar occurrence to someone else. Uh, we work to support public safety through uniform training, standardized protocols, quality assurance, and technological advances to 911. Uh, the foundation offers on-site and online courses, third-party quality assurance services, as well as other opportunities throughout the year, including our monthly Wednesday webinar. Uh, for more information, please email info at deniseamberly.org. So today's speaker, uh, Sergeant Carr, serves as a sergeant for the Southern Methodist University Police Department in Dallas, and he's also a sergeant in the United States Marine Corps Reserve. As a military member, uh, Sergeant Carr volunteers in Veterans Affairs, serves as Director of Communications for Heroes in Action, and is involved with the Civil Air Patrol, the Marine Corps League, and the SMU Military Veterans Student Organization. Uh, Jesse now serves as the Director of Community Engagement and Communications, as well as the Public Information Officer. Jesse is a member of the Honor Guard, a Texas Commission on Law Enforcement instructor, a Tactical Medical and Stop the Bleed instructor, a Firearm instructor and SWAT operator on the Crisis Response Team. In fall of 2020, he led the application process for the SME Police Department to become an active bystander for law enforcement certified agency, making SMU one of the first campus law enforcement agencies in the country to join this program. Jesse has since played an active role with the ABLE project through Georgetown University Law School, training and instructing law enforcement officers nationwide. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jesse uh, so he can start his presentation today. Awesome, thank you so much, Dago. Let me share my screen really quick. Perfect, cool. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm very excited to be here and, and really want to thank the foundation and, and thank Dago as well for for having me on here today. Um, I must admit that um, I am very much a, an interactive and an, an engagement um, type instructor. So um, not being able to, to see everyone's face and their reactions and facial expressions um, might throw me off a little bit. Uh, I would encourage you as we talk through some of this, please feel free to be active in the chat. If there's anything that you have questions on, if there's anything that you uh, maybe don't agree with or that you uh, have a different opinion on, please do not hesitate to um, drop that in um, and don't feel like you need to wait till the end. Um, but really fast before I get started, I'm not sure, uh, I know there's a handful uh, of people joining us who have, who have interacted with Dago before. He's the communication supervisor here for us at SMU as well. Um, but if my math is correct, and he's going to uh, hate me for this, but if my math is correct, today is also his birthday. Um, so if you would uh, just drop a, a happy birthday um, in the chat and, and wish Dago a, a happy birthday. Um, he is a uh, very experienced communications professional um, and, and brings a lot to the table for us and, and for the foundation as well. So thanks again to him for, for having me on. Um, and then I also want to acknowledge one thing that, that Dago didn't touch on as far as my background was um, that before I started as a police officer, um, I worked as a dispatcher for two and a half years. Um, so my introduction to law enforcement was, was working as a corrections officer for the state of Texas in a, in a prison, as a prison guard. Um, and then I started at SME as a dispatcher and did that for two and a half years. And, and, and so on that, I also want to, to thank and acknowledge um, all of you. And, and I know I'm a couple weeks early, but with telecommunicator week coming up in April, um, really want to thank all of you for the work that you do. Um, I can appreciate from inside the communication center, but also as a police officer, uh, there are very few things that, that play such an impactful role um, in the work that we do uh, as a good telecommunicator. Um, and, and so having 
having that professionalism and that quality on the other side of the phone and, and the other side of the radio um, does wonders for, for us out on the streets. Um, and uh, I, I don't think that telecommunicators get, get thanked enough. So that being said, now that um, I have that out of the way, we're going to kind of get into it. Like I said, please feel free to be active in the chat. I'm going to try to monitor it. Um, I know Doggo's going to as well, and and we'll interject if there's anything that I miss. Um, some of this is is going to be a little uh, a little broad. I'm going to try to cover as much as I can in about 30 minutes or so. Um, just know that this is kind of the the icing on the cake, so to speak. Um, typically, when we teach this, uh, and I've been teaching this topic specifically for um, just under three years for for law enforcement, um, any anywhere from professional staff to to police officers. Um, typically, this is an, an eight hour uh, class, so we're going to get a brief snippet, and hopefully, you'll see that there's some stuff in there that you can take back and apply um, within your communication center, um, but also, um, you know, maybe see some things. Hey, I need to look more into this, um, and I will make sure that I drop my email into the chat. Uh, actually, I'll do that right now. Um, that way, if you have any questions um, or anything uh, that you'd like more information on, please do not hesitate to uh, to reach out to me, um, and and I will do what I can to assist you. So, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about active bystandership and peer intervention in the workplace and what that looks like. Doggo pretty much already covered um, who I am um, and and all that fun stuff. So, as any of you that work for smaller agencies know that typically. Uh, you know, you, you wear four to five, sometimes six or, or more hats. Um, and, and so that's how we are, but but absolutely love being in Dallas and, and love uh, being able to, to work at SMU. So uh, what I'd like you to do right now, we're gonna circle back to this um, once we kind of get into to more of the slides, but uh, just on your computer or on a notepad in front of you, uh, just write down, it can be one sentence, two sentences, it can just be one word. Um, just kind of think to yourself, um, what does uh, what comes to mind when you hear the terms active bystandership and peer intervention? Um, and like I said, we're going to just think on that for a couple seconds. We're going to circle back um, to that uh, a little bit uh, lead, later in the presentation. But just think about it. When you hear active bystandership and peer intervention, what is it that, that kind of resonates um, in your mind? And, and what is it that you think about? Okay, so some of our, our learning objectives and, and some of the things I'm going to touch on today is we're going to definitely going to define what active bystandership and, and peer intervention is. Um, we're going to briefly discuss social science related to active bystandership and peer intervention. Um, typically, when we do this, we talk about four, four to five main social science experiments. Um, today, I'm just going to talk through one. I will tell you if that's something that fascinates you. Um, let me know if you want more information on that or, or spend some time just utilizing Google and looking into that. It, it, it's incredibly fascinating, the insight that it gives us into human behavior, um, and it is very eye-opening. It was one of the more interesting and exciting things that I uh, learned about as I went through this training myself um, in order to, to become a, an instructor and, and to teach this back. Um, then we're going to identify some of the inhibitors um, and talk about what are some of the things that that normally get in the way of training. Why don't we we say things when we see something going wrong, or, or why don't we step in or or enlist allies to to stop some sort of harm from occurring? And then, most importantly, we're going to talk through a, a handful of um, methods and skill sets to uh, intervene in a situation. Um, I know one thing that was eye opening for me when we started doing this is that our agency had a duty to intervene policy, um, but no one on our staff, aside from reading that policy and being and and acknowledging it um, we had no formal training on how do we intervene in situations what does that look like all the way from um, you know somebody who's having a bad day uh, and needs to go home and sleep because because their sleep schedules messed up to uh, you know someone's harming someone else and we need to step in and, and stop that harm from occurring so those are some of our objectives for today um, and we'll get right into it so it's really important as we do this that we acknowledge um, that there's there's two types of, of bystandership. Uh, one thing that that was eye-opening to me as I started to learn about this topic and, and understand it is I had 
I, I realized that I'd spent a lot of my life um, thinking that there was some sort of kind of middle area, right? There was an area that I could exist in where if I wasn't directly involved or if I wasn't directly impacted by what was happening, I could kind of turn away. I could, I could take advantage of tunnel vision um, and not really have to acknowledge what was going on. But one of the first things that we have to do um, is that we have to recognize that there's only two types of bystandership, okay? Um, there's, there's passive and, there, and there's active, right? And so passive bystanders fail to intervene or discourage intervention by modeling passivity, okay? And it's important that we, that we start to really think about this and understand this because um, of what that communicates, right? And so you, we see here a failure to act can communicate acceptance or even support for the misconduct thus turning passive bystanders into complicit bystanders. Um, and to me, that was really impactful because I started to realize, okay, hey, uh, if I'm not directly taking action to prevent harm that's occurring, I'm complicit in that. Um, so whatever analogy you wanna use, you know, you see somebody um, assaulting somebody else or verbally berating somebody else. Um, what we learned through some of the social science and with human behavior is, if I'm not taking action to stop that harm from occurring, I'm complicit in that, even to the extent that I might as well step in and uh, uh, carry out that harm with that other person. All right. Um, and, and then looking and identifying what is what is an active bystander. Um, active bystanders step forward, speak up and take action. And, and as we learn through this social science and some of these other things, um, through their actions, active bystanders can encourage others to intervene. And you probably hear me uh, sound like a broken record with this today. Um, one thing that's really important for us to keep in mind is with that and with this is that action will breed action and inaction will breed inaction. And we're going to talk about some specific terms that are important to that. Um, diffusion of responsibility, pluralistic ignorance uh, being a couple of them, um, and, and really uh, why those things are so important um, and, and understanding that what we do matters um, and the action that we take uh, will empower other people. And, and on the same hand, the, the lack of action um, in action will breed inaction. So like I said, we've identified the, the passive and, and active uh, bystander roles. And one of the big concepts here and, and key takeaways um, is really understanding this idea that there's no such thing as a neutral bystander. You're either helping or causing additional harm. All right, so there's there's no um, easy way, there, there's no middle ground for us to exist in. We are either uh, actively involved um, in in helping stop um, or we're, we're causing additional harm. Um, and so then that's, this kind of leads us to um, what is a bystander? And I'm gonna talk about, I'll go back to that slide in a minute and talk about Dr. Staub's definition. Um, Dr. Irvin Staub is a uh, psychologist and social scientist who we draw some of our studies from and, and he gives that definition. And so now I just kind of want to circle back to maybe some of the things that you jotted down if, if you're comfortable dropping any of those in the chat as far as from the beginning when you hear active bystandership and peer intervention, um, what is it? that you first think of? What is what is the first thing that comes to mind um, when you hear those terms? So if you are comfortable sharing and you, and you wrote those down, um, go ahead and drop uh, one of them um, in the chat uh, and uh, we can kind of talk about that for a second. I'm gonna get some water really quick. Yeah, perfect, I love that, right? So. Uh, peer intervention, appear willing to, to speak up and, and try to correct wrong being done. Active bystandership, watching what is happening but not intervening. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about that, Donna, why that's, um, you know, slightly different, but absolutely you're on the right track. And uh, Betsy stepping in, witnessing bullying, speaking up and doing the right thing when someone is being mistreated, absolutely. Um, love this. Uh, and so, you know what we'll kind of see with this is it, it's pretty it's pretty action based, right? So active bystandership is a little bit straightforward in the sense, right? The word active is in it. it, it it's pretty action based, um, but in teaching this and and 
you know, again, thinking back to when I went through it and, and teaching professional staff and police officers, um, mostly now in North Texas, but also all over the country, you know, initially we, we do tend to associate, oh, an active bystander, kind of just a witness, just somebody um, who's there who happens um, to see something. What you're going to see, though, as we go through this is peer intervention and active bystandership are almost synonymous. Uh, they, they essentially um, mean the same thing. So let's look at Dr. Staub's definition um, and see what he says. And, and the way he defines a bystander is a witness who is in a position to know that there is a need for positive action um, and is in a position to take some form of action. Okay, and, and I think what's part of what, what's important with this definition is also, you know, again, we've already identified there's two types of bystanders, right? There's active and passive bystanders. Um, and so one of the key components with this active bystander peer intervention um, is that uh, there's someone who is in a position to know that there's a need for positive action, and then they're in a position to take that action. And my challenge would be um, to all of you is that we are always in a position to take action, uh, but sometimes that action is going to look different, right? Sometimes that action uh, might mean that we're directly intervening in a situation. Other times that might mean that we're enlisting allies. Um, maybe it doesn't mean that we directly intervene, but we call someone else um, and enlist them as an ally to intervene. But towards the end, like I said, we're going to talk about some specific ways um, that we can do that to really to really kind of highlight for us and, and give us something tangible um, to take away from this. So I want to take a minute right now to kind of talk through some of the social science. Um, like I said, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very fascinating. One of the most interesting things about this is um, this is not, these studies were not conducted on law enforcement professionals or police officers. Um, these studies um, were conducted throughout the 70s and 80s and are just an eye-opener eye opener into human behavior, okay? Um, so it, it really shows us, hey, what do human beings do in certain situations? And I think um, no one knows better than uh, people that work in law enforcement uh, that, shockingly enough, most oftentimes people don't uh, do what we might think they would do, and they also don't always do the right thing. Um, and this level of moral courage that, that is required for active bystandership is, is hard and it's really a challenge um, if it's not something that we train to and that we talk about and that we uh, work towards, um, which is totally fine, but we just have to acknowledge, hey, this is something we have to practice um, and train on and, and have conversations about because we're not gonna randomly wake up one day on our own and just magically do it. All right, so the one um, social science experiment that I'd like to talk about today is uh, really shed some light on a couple terms for us. And then I'm going to highlight some some of the other key components from the other ones as well. So just to kind of give you this setup, you can see it on the screen. Um, but the way that they'd set this up, they're, they're studying subjects uh, and, and they bring them in. Um, and the idea is, is that they're, they're, the subjects they're studying are university students in a major city. Um, and they're bringing them in to have conversation with other university students to talk about university life. Um, and the way that that works is they get brought in. You can kind of see this this picture gives you an idea. They, there's a hallway with different rooms. Um, and there's one subject in each room. Um, and then what they're doing is they're having a conversation via an intercom with someone else. Um, and the way the intercom works, there's some timing where it would open and you could talk for 30 seconds, and then the mic would close, and then the other person would talk for a certain amount of time. Um, and very scripted, um, right? So they're, they're studying um, one subject uh, in that first setup. It, it, it's all very scripted, so everybody's getting the same um, exposure. And during the course of that dialogue, the person that the subject is speaking to, who's an actor, um, has what sounds like a seizure, something along the lines of a medical emergency. So they're really looking at, hey, how do people um, respond and react and, and what percentage of people uh, are going to take some form of action? Um, so they, they studied this um, with three setups, basically three conditions. So in the first one, there's, there's two students, but in reality, there's only one, 
right? So you have the one who's the actor who's pretending to have the seizure medical emergency. And then you have the second one who's the subject and there's just those two involved. So the one who's the subject knows um, in that moment that it's just them and the person that they're talking to. Um, and then as they go through that, they hear them having what sounds like a seizure. Um, and, and that's the first setup for the study. And then the second one, uh, they increase the number, right? So we're looking at, does the size of a group impact whether or not people are going to take action, right? That, that's one of the main takeaways with this. So there's three students, one's the actor, then there's two others um, that are subjects. And they know that there's there's three total people involved. And then for the third one, they, they did the same thing. They upped it again, right? So there's six students um, and uh, the, the subject that's being studied, then there's the actor, and then there's four other actors playing the role of, role of students. And so it, it's really playing on this idea of if we interject more people into a situation, how is that going to impact whether or not people take action? Okay, so we're gonna make this as, as interactive as we can. Um, and so, uh, and, and we're gonna talk about what the subject thinks in, in each scenario. So um, if you would, we're gonna use percentages. Okay, so um, in the first one, uh, the subject thinks that no one else can hear the seizure, right? It's the first setup. The subject knows that there's only two of them, the person themselves and then the person they're talking to. If you would just go ahead and drop in the chat, what percentage you think of those people when they hear the seizure happen, did something to try and help that person? So mind you, they're not in the same room, right? So doing something, they either got up and left the room to find um, one of the uh, researchers or they, they took some sort of action to try to find uh, help for that person, right? So, so Brian says 85%. Um, yeah, 75%. Okay, so we're all pretty high. <laughs> I love it. Amber uh, says 25%. She's a cynic. Well, you're not wrong. One of the things that um, uh, I, I talk about when we go through all four of these, if there's anything that will just not that uh, we as policing professionals need anything to ruin our faith in humanity even more. Um, but if there's one thing that'll really do it for you, it, it's going through these social science experiments um, and understanding that in fact, people do not generally inherently uh, do the right thing. Yeah, so lots of options. So typically we talk through, I would love to hear from those with really, really high numbers, why you think that's the case, those with really low numbers, um, why you think that's the case. Um, so let's see, for the first one, no one else could hear the seizure. What number do we have? Brian, uh, if I had something to give you, I absolutely would. You were the, you were the first right answer. 85% um, acted. All right, so that, that's pretty high. Um, you know, and that tells us that, right again, we're looking at that number. Uh, the less people involved in a situation, we're more likely um, to take action. All right, so I think it's uh, kind of, you know, we're, we're getting the gist of it. So there's one other person that could hear the seizure. What percentage, same thing, just drop it in the chat. What percentage do you think was, uh, would, would take some sort of action to go get help? And I think we could all imagine yeah, so Angel brings up a good point with that first one, right? They realize no one else can act and it's all on them. And that's very true. And there's some other experiments that, that really emphasize that as well. So yeah, we got some numbers all over the place. Um, absolutely, so let's take a look. So one other person could hear it. Uh, somebody just drop in the chat, tell me what do you think this number, you think it's gonna be higher or lower? When more people are interjected, we think that number is going to go down or up. I'm seeing a lot kind of all over the place. So yeah, Pam is right. All right, so one other person could hear the seizure. 62% acted. Yeah, everybody, yeah, right on right on point. Lots of, lots of uh, lower than that. So 
again, that same trend that we're seeing, right? The more people introduced into a situation, um, people are less likely to act. <laughs> yeah, Deborah, everyone will be pulling out cell phones to take pictures and video. Uh, absolutely. And <laughs> Brian, higher than you thought? Yeah, well, trust me, it only it only gets worse. Okay, so we have this one more setup. Four other people could hear the seizure. We already know, right, pretty straightforward, uh, unless someone someone really dissents and thinks that for some weird reason the number is going to be higher. Uh, 31%, okay, so a pretty drastic drop um, in uh, people taking action to help that person with the more people that are introduced. So really important takeaway for us in this. Um, it is really understanding uh, it, you know, the, this kind of impact that, that the amount of people involved in a situation has on what people do. And, and again, right, it, it's what I mentioned before, inaction breeds inaction, um, and action breeds action. And uh, absolutely right, um, they think that someone else will, will do it or did it. Uh, the more people, Angela, you're right, the more people, the more we think someone else will act unless there is is some sort of peer pressure. Um, absolutely. And, and Brian does bring up a great point um, as far as uh, how many people actually stop to help um, and 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 things like that. Um, and and I, I know that, that this is stuff that, that a lot of you probably know. Um, and are familiar with, maybe just haven't had it identified or talked through kind of the social science aspect, but absolutely right. Um, so let's look at some of these key terms from this. You may have heard me mention mention them, and and uh, and so let's define them. So the two big ones um, are going to be diffusion of responsibility, right? And that's this idea that someone else will do that, will will do it. Okay. So yes, we see this a lot as professionals. Um, why didn't you call 911? Well, I thought somebody else did. Or, you know, why didn't you stop and help? Well, I thought someone else would do it. Or I saw one other person there, so so why would I stop? Um, but I would encourage you to think about this a little bit. Um, and, and Julia, you're right, brings out the leaders and allows the followers to follow. Um, and I'm going to touch, I'm not going to cover it a lot, but I'm going to touch on a little bit um, with the authority hierarchy and how that plays into it and what that teaches us about social science. Um, but I would also encourage you to think about this in the workplace, um, right? So diffusion of responsibility, if you have any thoughts on this or anything that you can sum up in, in two to three sentences, you know, again, feel free to drop that in the chat. Uh, but, but the idea that someone else will, will do it. Um, and and that, can, that diffusion of responsibility can be anything to, um, hey, I saw an interaction between a, a dispatcher and a police officer and, um, that's my supervisor's responsibility. I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to let them do that. <laughs> Pam, you're right. Fill, fill the ice trays, right? Clean up the break room, uh, rinse out the coffee cups and put them in the, um, put them in the dishwasher. Yeah. And, and Jennifer, you're right. People might think it's the supervisor's responsibility to intervene or someone else's. Um, and, and, and sometimes that's absolutely the case. Uh, but make no mistake. Um, we all have a responsibility to responsibility to intervene in some capacity if there is some harm occurring. Um, and I know that harm is a little bit of a, of a harsh word. Um, a lot of times we think, you know, we might associate harm with, with maybe some sort of physical harm or something like that. Um, but I'd also encourage you to think about that in uh, the context. And Susan, you're right. We're going to hit on that in just a second with, with the inhibitors. Um, Think about this in the context too. I mean, imagine you, uh, you know, somebody that you work with every day um, and you can tell that something's off with them and something's going on and, you know, they look really tired or they tell you they've only slept four hours in the last 72 hours or something. Um, because there's a big health and wellness component piece of this as well uh, that we don't do great in law enforcement. We're starting to get better, but this idea of like, hey, you're not doing okay. You need to leave work go home and sleep. Um, and and so kind of think about it in that context as well. Um, and then we have pluralistic ignorance. No one else seems to think that anything is wrong, so all must be okay. Uh, so all must be okay. 
kind of ties into that idea of more people in a situation. Um, what's really interesting about that is, and, and you've probably all seen this um, personally and professionally, something happens, everybody kind of looks around waiting for someone else to define that situation and, and define whether or not it's good or bad. Um, and then in some cases, if no one has a negative reaction to it, we kind of just are like, well, uh, no one else said anything. So why would I be, um, why would I be the only one? And some of that also plays into the authority hierarchy, right? With the, some of the other social science experiments, we know um, that authority plays, authority, perceived authority plays a major role. And that's something to keep in mind from the communication center standpoint. Depending upon if you have a, a direct supervisor that works with you constantly, uh, maybe you're a trainer um, and you have that uh, authority dynamic um, between the trainee that you're instructing or, or you work in a communication center where you're um, nearby a, a trainer and a trainee. Just just keep in mind that that authority um, dynamic is, is real when it comes to active bystandership and peer intervention because we will look at that authority to define that situation. So if um, if you have a supervisor in that communication center with you, or if a, a lieutenant or or assistant chief or chief comes in and and something's happening, we're naturally going to look at that authority figure and wait for them to define that situation for us. Um, and and so that's a big part of this as well. Um, and then this other point, bystanders are far less likely to act when they know or think others are in a position to do so, and that really ties into both of the diffusion of responsibility and pluralistic ignorance. Um, and there's kind of a reoccurring theme here from the standpoint of, hey, if we can kind of think of an excuse to not have to step up and say anything, we're going to do that. Um, some of these other social science experiments are, are absolutely fascinating. Um, to, to some of y'all's points earlier, though, I will tell you, it will just uh, make you kind of rethink your expectation for for human behavior because, um, you know, people will not, uh, does not seem based on on those experiments that people will, will uh, inherently do the right thing. And and then we just have this, this quote that's kind of an example. If no one else is doing something, then I should neither. That's pluralistic ignorance. Um, and I'm sure someone else will act. That's that diffusion of responsibility. So again, those are some of the key terms from, from that experiment, again, big takeaway is it tells us, right, and it shows us the more people involved in a situation, the less likely we are to act, um, or anyone is, is the less likely anyone um, is to act. Um, so now let's talk about some of those inhibitors. So um, Susan hit on one, people are afraid to speak up for fear of retaliation. Bam, check it off the list. Uh, Y'all go ahead and drop in some of the other, excuse me, things that you might think about. Um, that would be an inhibitor to why someone might not intervene uh, in a situation, right? And we're I'm talking anything from um, some sort of toxic work environment to something against policy, to something illegal, to, to something that's harmful to someone else. What are some inhibitors that would stop someone from intervening in those moments? Liability. Yeah, Jamie, you bring up a great point because others don't want to hear it. And I wish I had more time so we could talk about, um, you know, receiving interventions as well, um, because that is a big component of this that in the in the full, like when we really talk about this in depth, <clears throat> we spend a lot of time on on teaching people, how, teaching people how to receive those interventions. So yeah, fear of retaliation, being judged, they just don't want to be involved. Absolutely, Latina, that tunnel vision, um, trying to stay in their lane, uh, absolutely a big thing. Yeah, Sherry, you bring up a really good point too, uh, being shot down in the past. Uh, so having a prior failed intervention, and I know like this sounds kind of formal, um, but usually it's pretty informal, right? Maybe there's a time, uh, a prior time where you stepped up and said, hey, we can't do that, that's a violation of policy, or hey, so-and-so is not doing well, we need to give them a day off to, to have a mental health day or, or something and, and then get totally shut down over that. Absolute inhibitor. Uh, yeah, Brian, taking an intervention as discipline, right? Um, and, and 
so part of that is important um, to make sure that, you know, if you are in a supervisor role or any type of leadership role within your communication center, if you're going to have anything like this or along these lines of peer intervention, that people know that it's not discipline, um, but then also something in policy that, that protects people who do intervene. Um, and again, these are these are moments that are as simple as, hey, we can't do that. That's a violation of policy to, um, hey, you're you're causing serious harm to to someone um, internally in the agency or externally in the community uh, based on your your actions. Yeah, lack of trust being gaslit when you do bring it up. Absolutely. OK, so let's look at some of these, what the experts will tell us um, are some of the inhibitors. Fear of retaliation, that's the first one. Um, fear of exclusion, uh, and then the fear of being wrong. So maybe we don't necessarily know the entire situation. Um, yeah, and, and Caden, you're right, not wanting to lose trust and confidence with your peers. Absolutely, you know, maybe you think that something's wrong, but you're not entirely sure the, the totality of, of the facts within that circumstance, and so you're not, you're not positive. Um, absolutely right. Uh, I, I know the dynamic is a little different. One of the things that we really harp on um, from the officer side when we when I talk about this is we never intervene in a moment where it's going to jeopardize someone's safety, right? So safety is our number one priority, uh, but that can also extend to the communication center. We never want to intervene in a moment where by us intervening, we're jeopardizing the safety of, of the people involved. Um, lack of knowledge, which is uh, a wonderful thing is, is why, you know, I'm so glad we're able to talk about this today. Again, just encourage you, this is a snippet. This is just a little bit of the information as it relates to active bystandership and peer intervention. But prior to me going through this and being trained as a trainer in 2020, I had never been taught how to intervene. Um, I had been taught a million other things that related to me being a police officer. I've been taught a million other things in the Marine Corps, never remotely been taught how do I intervene in a situation or if someone intervenes on me, how do I receive that intervention? Not my job, um, definitely brought up, just going to kind of stay in my lane. Um, the fear of crossing boundaries. So again, that uh, authority hierarchy, the perceived authority, trainers, supervisors, um, anything like that. Uh, fear of the intervention um, not being accepted, right? You brought it up before maybe, um, or you just know that the person is really difficult and you don't think they're going to receive it well. Um, prior failed intervention, right? What we already what we already touched on. <clears throat> and then again, that plays into that diffusion of responsibility uh, and the pluralistic ignorance. Let me go back just a minute. There we go. Um, so yeah, these, you know, all of these, Inhibitors, I, I think, you know, all of you pretty much nailed all of them. Um, and and they're, it's important for us to know and talk about these things because, again, um, if we're not discussing them, uh, you know, we're not going to know some of the things that get in the way of us of us uh, intervening. And I, I know that at some point in my professional career, I could probably uh, relate to every single one of these bullet points and think about situations that I had been involved in where I did not intervene, and had I intervened, it would have saved somebody's career or protected, um, you know, someone or, or something along those lines. And it was because of one of these reasons, right? Lack of knowledge or, or the fear of exclusion, the fear of retaliation. Um, and I don't bring these up to, you know, none of them are more credible than the other, right? All of these are important and all of these are legitimate inhibitors um, that will keep people from intervening. And it's important to, if you're a supervisor in a leadership role, to keep those in mind, you know, for the culture and, and for your your uh, communication center um, to know that, you know, when you're sitting there wondering, hey, why did my dispatcher not intervene in, in this situation? Probably one of these inhibitors is probably why. So now we're going to get into uh, very briefly uh, what I would kind of call the good stuff. Um, this is one of the, the, the methods, um, that we teach as far as how do you intervene? Um, there's really two main ones. Um, has anybody heard of the, the 3D option or that, you know, it's policing. So we have to throw a tactical in there. So it's the, 
tactical um, 3D uh, method actually was stolen from the Marine Corps. Um, if you're remotely familiar with it and you know what one of the Ds stands for, feel free to drop that in the chat. Um, we can discuss it a little bit. But but the 3D method and then PACT um, are two of the main ways that we talk about um, how do we teach someone to intervene? What does that look like? Um, and, and PACT is my favorite. So um, keep in mind, PACT can be used in any situation. Um, it's a little bit geared towards um, authority uh, and situations that involve some sort of authority dynamic or authority hierarchy. Um, this was actually something that was first started in the airline industry um, and was created for pilots. And uh, if you would, just drop in the chat, if, just let me know, um, why do you think that this would be, there would be some of that authority dynamic um, in the cockpit between the pilot and the co-pilot? Um, why could that be kind of a problem? And kind of what I mean by that, right, if we think about that in communications terms, you know, you have a senior dispatcher and a junior dispatcher working side by side. Um, and something happens and, the, you know, the question is, well, why didn't the junior dispatcher step in and say anything? Well, you have that perceived authority. Um, yeah, the undermining authority. Um, absolutely. And, and then as this relates to airline pilots, right, there's a, you know, there's off, obviously it, it's life or death when we talk policing and 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 dispatchers and call takers. Um, <clears throat> but it's a little bit more significant with pilots, right? Like they crash the plane and then uh, a lot of people die. Um, and so, uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so delegate, and uh, I don't know if that, Latina, I don't know if that was intentional, but delegate is one of the, one of the, the 3D options. So when we look at PACT, it's a four letter acronym. Um, and uh, stands for probe, alert, challenge, and take action. So we're gonna talk through this um, very briefly. Uh, so probe is, is, is obviously what the P stands for. It's the, it's the first one and it's pretty straightforward. Um, anytime you're probing in a situation, 99% of the time, it's going to be a question. Um, it's very non-confrontational. Um, it's very tactful and it's simply, um, like this example, isn't that a violation of policy? Uh, are we allowed to do this? Why are we doing this? Hey, uh, what are we doing? Um, always a question and very non-confrontational. Now, um, with PACT, one of the important things to remember is that this is not a one, two, three, four step process. Um, it is a all over the place matrix that whatever the situation calls for, that's the one that you jump in with. All right. So, uh, the second, the A stands for alert. Um, and what this does is this identifies something that is wrong um, and, and really kind of just does that, right? So per policy, uh, I think, and, and excuse my typo because that should say uh, we shouldn't do that. Um, I guess in some situations it, it could absolutely say per policy, I think that we should do that. But uh, in this case, it should say per policy, uh, I don't think we should do that. Um, but that's really just that alert is just identifying that something is wrong. <clears throat> and then we get into the challenge, right? And this, this is when it becomes more confrontational. So we're not only identifying, um, uh, not only identifying, but we're also confronting, right? Uh, and again, that should, I apologize on my, on my typos. Uh, I was, I work midnight, so uh was definitely making this at at two in the morning on on very little sleep but uh we are not allowed to do this you need to reevaluate your decision um and so true to to the nature of that word right a, a challenge identifies and then it confronts um what's going on and then the last one is is to take action uh and that's very straightforward and, and generally uh provide some um sort of clear path as to what you're going to do. So Jesse, if you do this, I will tell someone this is not okay. Um, but like I said, what's important to remember with this is you don't have to start with probe and then go to alert and then challenge and then take, take action. Um, 
you jump into whichever one the situation calls for um, and and whichever one uh, you you have the time and, and the situation allows you to to utilize really good with authority dynamics and authority hierarchy um, but I think this is my favorite one for um, any situation that warrants an intervention um, and so if we think a little less serious for a minute I mean you apply this to you have a coworker whose behavior is noticeably different hey what's going on are you okay is everything fine at home um and and i know um everyone here is is you know by nature of your job you're exceptional communicators you know and understand the importance of open-ended questions and things like that but don't think of this as like something super serious all the time i mean sometimes it's just that you notice a change in behavior and you're just probing you're you're trying to see you know hey i heard you made a comment about something's going on with your kid is everything okay uh do you need anything um and then from there you kind of start to see okay do i need to escalate this some right do i need to move to alert or do i need to skip alert and go straight to challenge um or you probe and then based on the answer that you get you're like oh holy cow uh i have to jump straight to um, I need to jump straight to taking some sort of action. And so then this brings me that kind of the thing and, and we're um, uh, about to wrap up um, that I really want to encourage you. And, and again, I, I cannot emphasize enough. This is a, a snippet um, as it relates to um, these kind of things in the workplace and <clears throat> uh, especially in, in law enforcement, but, but to really encourage you to keep in mind any of these situations that we encounter where we need to intervene. Um, I love this graph and I, I think it captures it perfectly, uh, right? So if you see at the bottom before event, early in the event, later in the event, and then after the event, um, and then, uh, you know, we have harm inflicted and the difficulty of the intervention. So, you know, what this is really telling us is as that timeline on the bottom goes, the harm that's inflicted is going to increase and then the difficulty of that intervention is going to increase as well all right so they're they're increasing simultaneously um and it, it, it's better late than never um to intervene but the longer that we wait to intervene in situations the harder it's going to become and so you know if we think about this you know kind of practically i mean you could have something before an event as simple as hey somebody's um had a significant personal life event they come in they're not really in the right state of mind and we don't intervene and then a couple hours later they do something unprofessional on the phone or on the radio and uh are being suspended or, or disciplined in some form or fashion because of that right and so that intervention is getting harder the harm that's being inflicted onto their professional career is increasing um, and really my point in that is again, you know, th this is, this covers everything, right? This, this, this covers, um, you know, all, all the stuff that, that we, we think to the extreme, but then also the, this, the more minimal stuff, Hey, somebody's showing up late for work four days in a row, right? Early in the event, maybe before the event a little bit. Um, and we intervene to, to see what's going on versus later in the event or after the event. Um, where they've been fired or they had something so significant going on in their personal life. Um, <clears throat> it's more extreme than that. Uh, so <clears throat> that pretty much covers everything that I have. Um, I know we didn't spend a ton of time talking about um, necessarily bullying or, or harassment specifically. Um, but I really wanted to, to focus on the on the peer intervention and active bystandership side <clears throat> because uh, those methods and that packed um, probe alert challenge take action can be used um, in any of those situations um, and uh, they're they're great ways to intervene. But like I said, this is just a brief kind of synopsis. There's so much more to this that is slowly making its way into policing. Um, and does not just apply to police officers. It, it applies to 
um, telecommunicators as well. So like I said, well, let me go back. Um, like I said, feel free to, if you have questions, if there's anything I can help you with, um, email. Um, obviously, you can reach out to Dago. Um, uh, and you know, happy to help in, in any way possible. That that is all I have. Um, if you have any questions, um, I'm I'm not in a rush, so I know we have a few minutes. Um, feel free to drop those into the chat. Uh, if anybody <clears throat> has any questions or or anything uh, about what we talked about. All right, thanks, Jesse. Uh, thank you guys all for being here. Thank you guys for attending. Thank you guys also for the birthday wishes. Um, so a few things I want to share with you guys. Um, I'm going to be sharing a link in the chat for our next webinar uh, in April. April is Autism Awareness Month, and so we're going to be having somebody from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children talking about some of the difficulties and unique challenges that telecommunicators face um, when dealing with missing autistic children. Um, I also want to go ahead and share some files. So if you guys check on the files that I've shared, uh, there's some information about different resources that we offer through the Denise and Relief Foundation. And then I've shared an offer um, with National Public Safety Telecommunicator Week coming up. Um, we are selling shirts. Um, so if you're interested in getting some shirts for yourself or for your center, definitely check out that link. Um, I know that for those of you that have been with us for the last webinar, uh, I know we've had some issues getting the certificates to you guys. Um, generally, the certificates should be going out either later today or tomorrow. If you guys do not get a certificate, um, I'll go ahead and share my email as well. Just email me, I would say Friday if you haven't gotten it, um, and we'll make sure that we get that to you guys. Um, again, if you guys have any other questions, um, please feel free to email myself or info at deniseamberlee.org, um, and make sure that you subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on Facebook if you aren't already to make sure that you're receiving updates about our foundation and uh, any more uh, webinars coming up in the future. All right, you guys have a great day.